but they will show us that place you call secret in you so that we might dwell there. Grant us grace to persevere until we are ushered in every one of us in Jesus mighty name we pray Amen you may be seated God bless you so yesterday we established that the subject of altars is central to enabling God to interfere legally in human affairs. The subject of altars is central in enabling God to legally interfere with human affairs. So if God is going to have legal entrance into our realm, then an altar must be raised. Like I said, prayer is earthly permission for heavenly interference. Hallelujah. We ended our discussion yesterday night by a definition, or we ended it with a definition that an altar is a supernatural landing strip a supernatural landing strip. And the scripture of Genesis chapter 28 that contains the encounter that Jacob had when he decided to rest at laws is a preferred scripture to buttress this point. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. All right, let's take a look at it. Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28, beginning from verse 11. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and laid down in that place to sleep. Um, if you are a good student of the Bible, when a word begins to occur too many times in one verse, you attempt to take note of it. The word that drew my attention in this particular rendering is place. He alighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set, and he took of the stones of that uh, place. So everything was about a place. Now, when he made those stones his pillows, what happened to him was that as he went to sleep, his natural senses, his physical senses were switched off, and then God switched on his spiritual senses and gave him the privilege to look upon the same location again from the realm of the spirit. Now, my question to you today is, have you seen your family from the realm of the spirit? You know, God did not show him another place. Are you, are you still with me? God showed him the same place, but he gave him and access to view that place from the realm of the spirit, that was where he was able to understand what that place was contained with, why that place is significant, why that place is strategic. You may never know what is contained in your family until God switches off your physical senses and switches on your spiritual senses and gives you an opportunity to perceive your family. Hallelujah.
a few days ago, a professor came to visit me at the office. Well read, well traveled, highly exposed, very intelligent, an established scholar. And he came to the office. And then we began to discuss the issues of interest, the issues that occasioned his, vis his visit. Then when we discussed the issues to a certain level, he now made it clear to me that in his own denomination, they don't do tongues, speaking in tongues, you know. And uh, he happens to be someone that is very rooted in his denomination. So he was not, visiting here was not one of the things he would want to do of his own accord, if not that, the issue that we had in common. We had one matter in common. <laughs> and that was what occasioned our, our encounter. But he told me that he just came from the village and uh, I think some prayers were conducted in the village or something through a relative that is Pentecostal that speaks in tongues. And there were some manifestations that took place there because of the prayers that were offered. And he came to the strange discovery of the fact that his family members were witches and wizards. It was a discovery. And he was troubled by this discovery because ah, even though he saw what the person that, was, that spoke in tongues produced, the results he produced, he said, well, we don't speak. But the result I'm troubled about came through someone that well, the issue today is not about tongues. The issue today is, have you had the opportunity to see that your family from the realm of the spirit? This man came to a location. This man came to a place. And the Lord blotted out the impact of his physical senses activated his spiritual senses to look upon the same location. And what he found was different from the way that location was structured in the natural. Should I say to you that if you have not seen your family from the realm of the spirit, you don't know your family. You don't even know how to take your journey. You don't know whether you are in a state of emergency as we speak. The things that he saw were things that were sustained on that location on the account of the website that his grandfather had opened in form of a, an altar that is set up in that location. Are you there? It was here. It was here. We were doing fasting and prayer like this. And when, during the course of the fasting and prayer, one of our sisters that is very devoted in this ministry, she got married and she couldn't take in for a period of time that, uh, you know, we expected her to have taken in. So she came to the office and complained. And because she's one of the old members, I have prayed with her, I discovered that uh, there was an altar in her father's family that was responsible for her inability to conceive. So I asked her to go and report the case to the dad, which she did. And then when the dad came, I told him that uh, can you confirm that while you were growing up, your father had a very powerful altar 
that regulated the activity of the family. He confirmed that. I said, do you know the location where that altar was raised? He said, well, the family has moved from that place, and, uh, but he will be able to locate it. That was how I put fuel in my vehicle, and we took a trip. I asked the husband of the lady to come with me. So it was me, the father, the lady, her husband. Who again? Yes, Philip, Evangelist Philip. And we took up. So when we got to the place, we went and greeted the younger brother to the father. And then that one stays in the village. So we told him the reason for which we came. And now we were to visit the location where they grew up. I was duly informed that that location cannot be accessed with a vehicle. So we started moving on foot. We went past the river and went into the forest. In the middle of the forest, they saw symptoms that suggested that that was where they grew up. And then we stopped our journey in the middle of the forest. Should I tell you something? That altar that was raised in that place made the place barren. Nobody could stay there. You are kidding. If you, because you moved to Lagos, <laughs> you thought you are far away. <laughs> May the Lord give you an encounter in the next five minutes. No human being could stay close to that altar. In fact, the, the foundation of the house where they stayed, they saw it. Okay, this is the, we saw it. This is the foundation of the house. And then the kitchen will be this side. We saw the foundation of the kitchen. All right? And then if the kitchen is here and the house is here, then the altar. There was no physical thing on that spot where the altar was. I know somebody is saying, ah, pastor, you, you like to... Hold, hold on. So I, we started praying. After praying for a while and I got access into the realm of the spirit, I spoke to the spirit. Say your link with these people through the altar of their grandfather. Today, I destroyed that link. I spoke to the spirit again. Three things I told the spirit. And I spoke under the authority of Jesus Christ. One month after that exercise, the lady took it. Now, so what I'm telling you is what I know. My question, please help me preach. Help me ask your neighbor, have you seen your family in the realm of the spirit? You might just discover that that woman that you took her son and you are training is a woman that took your, clo your clothing for spiritual trade. It is therefore needful for us to pray before the end of this service for the Lord to open our spiritual eyes. According to the Bible, if all you have for sight are your natural eyes, the Bible calls you blind. For why we look not on the things that are seen, for the things that are seen are temporal, and the things that are not seen are eternal. Jacqueline, exactly. we didn't need to go to the village again for her to conceive the second time. That, that decree we established in that place limited the activity of that spirit. Hallelujah. In the course of our evangelical campaigns, 
That's not all. The, the altar of a community, we brought it down. The elders that said that we're managing it said we will not leave for up to two months after committing such sacrilege. We've lived, we are still here. But do you know, the entire village was liberated to Jesus. The, the impact, the effect of, of what we did at the background. When we now came for crusade, everybody just gave their life to Christ. Hey, hey, you want, hey, everybody. You went to do crusade. You didn't know that the thing that was holding the people down was a system that was built in the community. So you prayed and you went for the crusade and then you discovered that the results you were expecting, you didn't quite see those results. It's not because you didn't try. There is something else you did not touch. Before Moses delivered the children of Israel, he, he ministered to the land first. He displayed the spiritual powers that were resident in the territory. Because of the book of Exodus, I had to study the ancient gods of Egypt. I had to go and study it in order for me to understand why God gave the directives that he gave concerning the deliverance of his people from the land of Egypt. Every judgment that God gave was a judgment on one of the gods of the land. The man ministered to the land first before he began to minister to people. Today we want to minister to people and in fact, we have no intention to minister to the land, so we come to people. And we don't understand that if the meaning of territory, because that's why I said you should take note of the word place, the meaning of territory is the infrastructure that is responsible for the spiritual activity that is predominant in that location. If you are still with me, say amen. Meanwhile, just for the sake of balance, because somebody might take off from this conference and go to his village and bring their altar down, I need to also say something quickly so that you'll be protected. Now, the altars we brought down, are you, are you here? Are you? That community altar that we brought down was by instruction. The community... You are not listening to me. Listen carefully. I know there are people with zeal here. The community altar that we brought down, we brought it down by instruction. Meanwhile, as a pastor over that sister, I don't need any instruction. My authority over her life qualifies me to go to that altar and minimize the activity of that spirit that it will not include this one because she's under my authority. So I don't need any permission, any instruction to do that. My status as a pastor over her life already enthrones me in the capacity of authority to make transactions for her liberty. Are you there? But the community one was by instruction. And when you have such instructions, it is not just your effort that day that produced the victory. There were intercessors in the territory that were praying for that. And then when you came, God now made you the answer to their prayer by asking you to go bring that altar down. And that's why when we do priesthood, your spiritual ears to hear and to see must be clear. The, the Lord will clear it out. And, and that's why I said maybe in tomorrow's service, I will show you how spirits communicate and how the Holy Ghost speaks. Because if you are going to operate in the realm of faith, in the realm of the intangible, in the realm of the invincible, uh, first of all, you need healthy spiritual senses. 
you need to know the experience of, of receiving conviction from the Holy Ghost. You need to know how the experience feels like. Because the tools that you are going to be using to do business, the business of faith, obeying God, responding to God, the tools you are going to use are tools that the spirit being that you are engaging we make available. So I need to make you very, very acquainted with those tools so that you will know when the Holy Ghost wants you to run, when he wants you to stand, when he wants you to seek, and when he wants you to walk away. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. So when you ask your neighbor if you, he, has, he or she has seen his family from the realm of the spirit, what did they answer? What was the response? Most of them didn't talk. Okay, let's punctuate there and pray for five minutes. Let's pick one family. Ah, if we do that, my lecture will be, we will not finish this lecture. And we, have, we must finish this lecture today so that, because if we don't finish, we'll be dragging. And this thing has been programmed to cover the entire fasting period. I want us to finish it. Are you following me? Okay. So an altar is a supernatural landing strip. It is the altar that Abraham raised on that location that was responsible for all the activity, spiritual activity that began to take place in that location. And you will see the spiritual activity in verse number 12. Verse number 12. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up upon the earth, and the top of it reached the heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And that's not all. But you see, I want to open your eyes to something. Okay, maybe when we talk about uh, the difference between godly altars and righteous altars, we will still need to consult this scripture. Go back to verse, are you in verse 12? Yeah, verse 12. Stay in verse 12. Now, I will still repeat it and I'll take you into more detail when we speak about the difference between righteous altars and evil altars. We have to come back to Genesis chapter 28, verse number 11. Hallelujah. Those of you that are in custody of little children, I know the, the Holy Ghost is here, and the spirit of the children has made them excited. Um, can you find wisdom on how to ensure that the excitement does not impact upon what we are doing. The Lord will help you in Jesus' name. Now, we'll need to come back here when we want to talk about uh -uh, what is happening to this, my people. Now, take note of something quickly. Take note of something. I would like you to take note of the word ladder. Take note of the word ladder. And the reason why I say you should take note of the word ladder is because I have something to tell you. I'd like us to take a look at the orientation of the apparatus that is set up in the territory. The first item that was mentioned in that territory is a ladder. And if you look at it critically, you will see that the ladder was set up from earth and the top of it reached where? Heaven. Now, stay with me. Stay with me. In spiritual geography, not in physical geography, in spiritual geography, heaven is above. 
hell is beneath. Are you there? I know you know that in physical geography, because of the way the earth is, it is the uh, force of gravity that is keeping us glued to the ground. So that when you jump, you go down because of gravity. The reason why there's gravity at all is because the earth is spherical. We are close to the equator. People in South Africa, when they say up, where they are pointing is different from where we will be pointing if we say up. Do you get, you get the idea? So this matter of above is true spiritually. Because the Bible talks about heaven above, it talks about hell beneath. And from spiritual geography, the earth is between heaven and hell. I can show you scriptures, and I don't want to do that today. I can show you, but trust me, this is scripture. I can show you scriptures that every scripture in the Bible that talks about hell calls it down. Every scripture that talks about heaven calls it up. The most graphic picture of hell that is given is in the book of Luke chapter 16. And we know the story of Lazarus and the rich man. All right? Now, I'd like you to take note of there's a Greek word that has no English counterpart that is used in the Bible. And that Greek word is Hades. Now, in your English Bible, it is used interchangeably for hell, but theologically is not very accurate. Because there is, Hades means the place of departed spirits. When a man dies upon the face of the earth, his spirit is going to journey into Hades. Actually, his spirit with his soul, his spirit component, the immaterial part of him, spirit plus soul, is going to journey into Hades. Are you there? Now, this realm is an immaterial realm. So when you hear that Lucifer in heaven, he used to walk up and down and to and fro in the midst of the coals of fire. That fire that is spoken about is not physical fire, it's spiritual fire. Have you ever been in a deliverance parlor where deliverance is being conducted? Have you been there before? And then you see somebody behaving as if fire is burning the person. But that fire is not physical. That fire is literal, but it is spiritual fire. Just like you have fire in the spirit world, you also have water in the spirit world. In fact, there are 12 things that you have on earth that you have equivalents in the realm of the unseen. When we talk about the shape of heaven and the 12 interactions between the earth and the heavens, then I will show you some matters, but not today. So when a person dies, his spirit wanders into Hades, because Hades is the place for departed spirits. And his spirit goes in accompaniment with his soul. The silver cord is the ribbon that is used to tie a man's soul to his body of earth. And what we call death is actually not death. It's just that the silver cord got loosed. So the soul and the spirit can walk free from where the body is. What we call death is separation. Have you gone to the book of Genesis? Oh my, you're not with me. Okay, let's, let me leave my explanation. You're not, you're not interested. 
If you go to the book of Genesis, you will see statements like God divided the day from the night. Separation. God divided this from that. Huh? So that thing we call death is actually separation. It's to untie the ribbon. The ribbon that is called the silver cord that connects the soul with the human body. And when that happens, this personality that has been warehoused, that is, that is living inside your body of earth, we walk out of that house. Because that personality is not designed to operate in this three-dimensional world, there is a world that can contain that personality. Are you there? But if you have studied your Bible, the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. The next kingdom event after death is called judgment. And judgment in the kingdom of God is reserved for a set specific time. So everyone that dies, therefore, is kept in a place of waiting called Hades, awaiting judgment. Meanwhile, why did I come here? This talk, how did it come? Wait, let me find out why we are here. Ladder, ladder, ladder. <laughs> Hallelujah. So this is the first time I've, I'm impressed with this, my class, the first time. <laughs> So this, you know, the person walks into that place, the place of the Father's Spirit. The person will be admitted into that place. If, when you get into that place, the place has two compartments, according to the Bible. One of the compartments is called, there is really no English word for it, too. It's called Jehina. Now, Stay with me. For those of you that have been to Israel before, that place, are you there? That place where Jesus was crucified is Golgotha. Hmm? Um, you know, in Makoti, there's high level, there's Wurukum, there's Wadata. So Golgotha is the Makodi. The spot where Jesus was crucified is Jehina. You know why the place is called Jehina? Because they, in ancient Israel, they used to pour refuse there. So people put fire on the refuse. So there is a fire that is always burning in that location. And that's why they called it Jehina. The unquenchable fires. Are you there? That aspect of Hades that has unquenchable fire is where, where we call hell. And it's a temporal place. It's not permanent. So the man that walked, in, in fact, as you walk into Hades, you will know whether your dwelling place, where you'll be waiting. This, I hope you know the entire arrangement is, is a waiting area. If you have ever used a, a plane before, an airplane, they advise you to come three hours, if it's international, three hours before the flight, so that they can finish all the modalities of checking you in, checking your bags in, and then you walk into the waiting area and uh, you wait for your flight. In the waiting area, there are different types of waiting area. I flew for long before I discovered that it's not everybody that waits in this open hall. There's Executive lounge. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. When you get somewhere and there's a better option, trust God for you to be operating from the better option. In the name of Jesus. Yeah. I am speaking to somebody's faith. Let your faith in be increased. So there, there, there's something called executive lounge. But you know what? Whether you are in the open waiting area or in the executive lounge, what are you doing? You are waiting. Did you get that? Yes. All right, so the people that are assigned to wait in Jehina, where there is fire, 
those ones, uh, they did not die with the spirit of Christ in their spirit. And if you look at them from the immortal perspective, the moment you see them from that realm, you will know where this one is going. Because, are you with me? Because the spirit of Christ, if it's in your spirit man, it manifests like a garment that is white. And if the spirit of Christ is not in a man, you will see black smoke coming out of his head. The man is black, but you will see black smoke. I am telling you this by the eyes of the Spirit. I will not, I will not talk more than that. If you come into Hades, and the moment you walk out of that, your body of earth, and you notice that you are glowing, glowing like, like a fluorescent light, it means the place you are going to wait is called paradise. All of them, paradise plus Jehina equals Hades. Did you, did you get that? So now, coming to Lazarus and the rich man, the Laz Lazarus was in paradise. Paradise has many names in the Bible. One of the names of paradise is Abraham's bosom. Why is it called Abraham's bosom? Anybody has a clue? Ah. He's the founder of faith. He's the founder of faith. Our faith in Christianity is faith in a person. And the name of the person is called Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ happens to be the first example of a man that died, went to Hades, he resurrected from Hades, and he ascended into heaven. Only Jesus, he was the first man that had that experience. The hope that we have today, that if our pilgrimage on this world is accomplished, that we will rise from Hades and, and rise into the heavens, is called Jesus Christ. That's the hope. Because it is what, what he went through, how he went through it, that's what we will go through. He, his, he, his accomplishments is, is our destiny. Before Jesus, no one ever left Hades without returning. People like Lazarus left Hades temporarily, only to go back. So if you are leaving Hades gate, Hades will say, okay, when you finish, we don't know what is drawing you there out of our custody, but you will still come back to us. The first person that left Hades, never to return, his name is called Jesus. Our faith in Christianity is in him. As long as our faith in him, we die with our faith in him, Hades has no power over you. You will walk away because you'd have no covenant with death. Exactly. So there are two compartments there. We have Jehina, which is hell, and then we have Paradise. So can you see we have a normal long lounge for all kinds of people. We have a special lounge for righteous people, but we are all waiting. Exactly. This 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 world, this world called Hades is what the Bible calls theologians call the underworld. Exactly. Good. The ladder that I asked you to take note of. Can you, can you still trace the orientation of this ladder? This one that you are looking at now, it begins from earth and then reaches into where? Heaven. I came to tell you that that's not the only orientation that that ladder can have. If it is a righteous altar that you have raised, the orientation of the ladder will connect earth to heaven. So the realities that your altar is going to bring are the realities of heaven. Angelic beings and angelic strongholds. You'll be having angelic encounters because the ladder connects earth and heaven. 
If a man raises a demonic altar, the orientation of that ladder is going to be different. The ladder will con co connect it and the underworld. So the creatures of the underworld are the ones that will now find fellowship on the account of the orientation of the ladder. How many of us still remember the scripture when Jesus said, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of, what? No, in the Greek is Hades. Hades. So it is Hades that is contending with the church. The church is set up in the earth as an extension of the kingdom of God upon the face of the earth. But the church is going to come into open confrontation with Hades because there will be altars that sons of the kingdom of darkness will set up upon the face of the earth that will bring the authorities of Hades to this realm. So you understand what I mean when I say it is what a supernatural landing strip. If you got it to that point, then we can leave this point and go to the next one. If you didn't get it, I can use other scriptures. This matter is a big matter. This matter. Please ask your neighbor again. Have you really seen your family from the realm of the spirit? Have you, have you seen them? In a polygamous setting, the daughter of the younger wife is to be given out in marriage. And the older wife has three children, female children, much older than the one that is marrying. And nobody even came to say, how are they? How you be? <laughs> No sign. So on the traditional way, they were dancing. She had gone to visit an altar. And they gave her a liquid. Just rub it on the stomach. All those dances, you people dance, and your, your spirit sleeps. And the woman was able to go there. She, she took money to spray. Buru, 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 para, buru, 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 para, buru, 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 para, buru. Nobody saw her except the cameraman. It was a strange sight. He's been covering many, many occasions. So what the cameraman did was that he cut that part and put it online. So when the family people say, ah, mm, I don't want to go into the, but that day, salvation came through the, the camera man. Because when the, the video, the video, ah, it, spread, it went viral, not to you in the family within the family. And it generated a civil war. But at the end of the day, they compelled the woman to reverse. You know, there was no spiritual person there, so they had to use demonic reversal methods. And you know the implication of a demonic reversal method <laughs> is that there are demonic deposits left, left behind. The only cure to darkness is light. <laughs> if you don't find the cure in light, that thing they are doing in darkness is called complication. I don't know if that lady has been able to give birth till this day. Oh, the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Number two. An altar is a system designed to secure answers from a spirit. An altar is a system designed to secure answers.
from a spirit being. First Kings chapter 18, quickly. If you have your Bible. First Kings chapter 18. We'll begin to read from verse 22, 1 Kings chapter 18, beginning from verse 22. When you go for weddings, when you go for burials and all the things that bring family members together, there's one of the lectures we're going to do. I will show you things to look out for. Because most times we go there, we don't know where to look. If you see any of these signs, know that you are at war. Stop eating, stop drinking, and start praying. Then Elijah said unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophet are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks. And let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answers by fire. I let him be God. The moment we begin to talk about altars, it means that there are human beings that need answers. The way to secure answers is the way of the altar. The God that answers by fire. So altars are systems that are put in place to secure answers from spirit being. A God that answers by fire. Let him be God. A God that answers by fire. Now, people that worship evil spirits, I worship demons, they are not as foolish as we think. And the reason why I say so is because that thing they worship knows how to secure answers. The reason for their continuous devotion, their continuous patronage, is the history of answers that that dimension of priesthood has secured. So when you come preaching the gospel to them, the way to preach to them is to create another channel of answers. You know, when Moses came to speak to Pharaoh, he said, let the dust hear the Lord God of the Hebrews. Let my people go that they may serve me. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? that I might obey him. He was not asking a theological question. That you bring a concordance and say the word God is an acronym which means greatest order of divinity. <laughs> that was not what <coughs> Pharaoh was requesting. He said, what are the answers <laughs> that your God can produce? Because Janice and Jambres here have their way with answers. The church, the end time, and I hope you know, in the end time, the Bible says that as Janice and Jambres withstood Moses, that's how the truth is going to be withstood in the end time. The, the battle of the end time will be fought on the ground of, of the supernatural, the ground of answers. Oh, you want your family liberated? 
Let me tell you how it will happen. You bring your own, your own altar and you generate. There's no way that battle will end peacefully. Men will die in the process. Like, do you understand that? Oh. I know you like peace. But if we, have, if we, if we introduce altars, it will not end in peace. It, it will be conquest. It will be by conquest, not by peace. If, if, if we want peace, it's in the court, the court of law. That's where they set for, <laughs> they settle in peace. But if this matter has gone to the level of altars, no, it will be solved by answers. He said, you guys take two bullocks. You can cut your sacrifice in pieces and put it upon the wood and put no fire on that. I will spread my sacrifice before the Lord and the God. That what? How many of you need answers as you are sitting? You need answers? So we need an altar. If you need answers, we need an altar. The God that answers by fire. The God that answers by fire. I know you must have heard that in the village, people that know how to manipulate altars, people fear them. Why do they fear them? Answers. They can secure answers from the spirit that they are. Oh, you think that a man of God that knows Jesus huh, is any different? <laughs> it's not different too. Sometimes you are even attacking him, he doesn't know. The angelic infrastructure that attends to his altar, there are some, oh my, evil things can happen just because of that. The God that answers my fire. So it's a system through which we can secure what? Answer. An altar is a place of communion where natural entities can commune with supernatural entities. A place of communion. We can check this out in the book of Exodus chapter 33 beginning from verse 7. Exodus 33, beginning from verse 7. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of congregation. Now, I'd like you to see the vision he had in mind. And it came to pass that everyone, underline one, even though it is called the tabernacle of congregation, it is not a community, it's not a corporate fellowship system, it's a personal fellowship system. Everyone which sought the Lord went out onto the tabernacle of the congregation, the tabernacle that belonged to the congregation but it is a facility that is built for personal intercourse with the spirit realm. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Everyone which sought the Lord went out onto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. Yes, verse 8. And it came to pass when Moses went out onto the tabernacle, that all the people rose up and stood up every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. It was the tabernacle of the congregation. All the children of Israel had right to this place, but it was only Moses that was going. That's how it is in the new covenant. We have right to the presence. We have right to the dimensions of God's glory but you don't come. I don't come. 
How can we advance in the things of God? Meanwhile, are you there? Okay. Verse 9. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudly pillar descended and stood at the door of the tab tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. You will notice that that system can only accommodate one individual per time. The moment the individual enters into the vault, the fire, the pillar will come from above and block the door. Once you gain entrance, it comes from above, it blocks the door. Nobody else can enter. Because the communion you have having is going to be specific to you. It's going to be idiosyncratic. It's going to be individualistic. This is what God has that the devil doesn't have. If the devil needs to deal with people, he deals with them as a group. The devil cannot deal with people in their specific context of destiny as individuals. He doesn't have the resources to manage that kind of administration. It means that there are encounters that only you will have in the presence of God. God can sponsor specific encounters that are unique to you. And if you don't have it, nobody else will have it. And just in case you have it, it is yours and yours alone. And that's why we believe God differently. We respond to God differently because we had different encounters. The moment he access, accesses this place, God comes and shuts the door himself. And then the Bible says, and the Lord talked with Moses. Yeah, next verse. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped, and every man in his tent. Door. So their own worshipping, they were doing it in, at the door of the tent. And they are worshipping the glory of God that Moses' personal relationship with God brought down. So when they see that glory, they say, hey, he is God, the Lord is God, the Lord. But it was Moses' personal relationship with God that was bringing that dimension down. Verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face. This is the quality of relationship that was obtainable in that tabernacle. And I would like to really emphasize it as much as I can. The Lord spoke unto Moses face to face. You see, when you read face to face, some of you will think you understand what it means. <laughs> and the Lord spoke to Moses face to face. And he said, yes, I know what it means. It's just, no. He went further to explain unto us what he meant by face to face. What is face to face? As a man speaketh unto his friend. The first thing we can draw from the, the qualifier that was used is that it was not a formal relationship. It was not the kind of relationship you will find in the, in the army. I remember when we went for youth service, Kano, Kano was 15 degrees, 15 degrees. And some nights it will be 12 degrees in the night. The moment you put your back to to rest, you hear pa 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 And the way, I don't know what instrument is that, but it doesn't matter how you slept, whether you in the dream you are in the forest, you will hear. <laughs> you will hear that sound in the forest there. And when they give you additional five minutes and you are not up from your bed, Ah, that's not how the relationship between Moses and God was. He spoke to him face to face. He spoke to him as 
a man speaketh unto his friend. You know, this is the kind of relationship that Adam had with God. When he came in the garden in the cool of the day to meet with Adam. You might wonder, why is it that God always took time to come meet with Adam in the garden? Those moments were training moments, capacity building moments. It was like a school. The reason why Adam needed to be schooled was because Adam was created an adult. Adam did not grow like my daughter, Debbie. He didn't say, Dada, Mama, Papa. Adam just came and he was a man. He said, eh, How are they? <laughs> he did not have the opportunity to grow. He was created a man. You know the problem with that arrangement? Even though he had a big body, he was still a child. So he was a small man in a big body. I just pray that that's not how you are. So God came to him in the cool of the day to train him. Adam needed the education that God was coming to give him. It is on one of those trips that God told him the thing that Adam can do so that he will die. Can you see how important those moments are? When you look at the description of the kind of relationship that Moses had with God, the Bible says that God spoke to him face to face as a man will speak to his friend. It was an informal relationship. You see, my wife runs a nursery and primary school. If you have children, two years and under, three years and under, four years and under, and you want to get stuff into their head, the only way for you to succeed in your intention is that you must make that your education an occasion for play. It must be very, very informal. If not, you cannot communicate knowledge to the people of that category. What was happening to Adam was that he was in school. And the kind of school that Adam was in was actually primary school. So the teacher came one day for lecture and the student had absconded. <laughs> Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? It became a problem. The pupil had escaped from class. And the lecturer was going around looking for where the pupil was. That is your case. <laughs> <laughs> you <left> the, <laughs> the presence of God, this kind of relationship is a capacity building program. Oh. Sometimes God will even give you information about things that will take place 15 years before time so that you can begin to prepare your mind. You know, your dest you don't look like your destiny. You don't look like what God has called you to do. You don't look like it. You don't even have the grace to power it now. It will take a meticulous process. God will keep bombarding you with it until you can come to terms with it in your heart. It, it, what God wants you to accomplish, you are a stranger to it. So you need, you need times of communion, times of, he needs to speak to you, not formally, you will not learn. If he comes and says, I am Jehovah, ah, you won't learn, you will escape from that place. So he, he, he comes like, like, like a primary school teacher. And he speaks to you face to face. As a man, speak it unto his friend. If it is true that you are managing an altar, 
When you begin to talk about God, we'll know you, ha you have spent time in that school. The other day, those days when electronic Bibles were not uh, common, uh, the only Bibles we had were hardcover Bibles. They invited the prophet on the pulpit to come carry out a function, and he wanted to open to Jeremiah. He did not succeed in the whole 45 minutes of his time on, <laughs> on the pulpit. He did not succeed in opening. So he was, when he tried and failed many times, he just took the mic and prophesied. <laughs> Are you there? He has not been, he has not been here. The problem that this school has is that all the puppies have escaped. <laughs> you are making me laugh. I'm very serious now, very, very serious. All the puppies, all the puppies <laughs> have escaped. They ran away. The, the lecturer is, look, where art thou? The presence of God is empty. He came for intercourse. He came for education. He brought, he brought his chalk, brought his blackboard. He's hanging it. But then he realizes they are not here. They are not here. They are not present. I was in 300 level in the university here. Because this is my culture. Before I study my books, my academic books, I study the Bible. I don't open anything until I've read the number of chapters I read every day. And while I was studying the Bible, one of those nights, I heard his voice. I thought it was a Bible study topic he wanted me to study. The voice said, a prophet like John the Baptist. Okay. So I now started studying about John the Baptist. I now realized that John the Baptist wore the spirit of Elijah. There were aeons apart, but their dress code was the same. It was the spirit that was upon Elijah that came upon this man called John the Baptist. And even though he never saw Elijah, he began to dress like Elijah. He began to eat. In fact, his menu was a product of inspiration. He ate locusts and wild honey. Are you there? The same way Elijah spoke truth to power, that was how John the Baptist spoke truth to power. John the Baptist, because of his witness, was placed in the dungeon. He was still speaking truth to power. There was a spirit that was upon him that bore such strong witness. His testimony and his witness un unsettled the government of the time. Because he was a carrier of the spirit of Elijah. So I did that whole Bible study. That was a message I prepared for many years and I never preached it. I never knew that it was not a, a sermon to be preached. That it was the life that I was going to live in the future. That God was going to put the spirit of Elijah upon my life. And those of you that have sat under my ministration for a long time, you will know when that spirit is at work. It changes. It begins to talk. And that talk, now the thing talks, it can shake tables and break it. That witness, that witness that comes, when that anointing comes, when that anointing comes, it has little tolerance for unrighteousness, unfaithfulness, for corruption. He speaks against it. 
it causes it. The reason why God had to tell me before time is that there is no kind of anointing that causes more trouble than that anointing. I mean to the person that carries it. Because of the kind of witness that he bears. It is in one of those moments of communion that that understanding began to drop. What would have happened to me if I missed class that day? Something can eventually come upon you that you don't know how to manage, you don't know its purpose. You can now, go, you can now become guilty of merchandising a spiritual resource that God made available because you were not, you were not available in class to be taught how to steward it to the glory of God. The Lord is crying. And you know what he's saying? My children need to come back to class. Our prayer point this in evening is simple. Lord, I come back to class. Now, are you here? You are an evangelist. You're supposed to be a youth evangelist, hopping from campus to campus, getting young upcoming people to see Jesus and to cause their hearts to bow in repentance to him because you have not attended classes. You do not know that that quiet calling that is upon your heart is a strategy that God has put in place to secure the future that is to come. The most minute things that your heart begins to contemplate are major dealings that reveal policy directions of heaven designed to forestall dangers of demonic infiltration. Can we labor in the presence of God in the next 15 minutes? I come back to class. I draw near. I draw near with a sincere heart, with full assurance of faith. Having my heart sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. So that I can pick frequencies coming from your heart. Eesh. Mora hasiko brema is kobolo horokasi komandeli. I come back. I come back. I come back to class. 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 Mira kasatoria. Amanto kobrege de. There was a time you could endure the burden of the presence of God. You could endure it. You could endure long times of fasting. You could endure it. Because of your desperation to collide with his glory and to touch his presence. Tonight, you want to say, I come back. I come back. I come back. I come back. I come back to class. I come back. And my desire... My desire, my desire is to walk with you, my Savior, on this holy journey until I am known, and my desire. My desire, my desire is to walk with you, my Savior, on this holy journey 
until I am no more. My desire, my desire, my desire. My desire is to walk with you, my Savior, on this holy journey until I am no. My desire, my desire, my desire. My desire is to walk with you, my Savior, on this holy journey until I am no. Singing my desire, my desire, my desire is to walk with you. My Savior, on this holy journey until I am old, sing my desire, my desire, Oh. 